Welcome everybody to today's edition of our webinar on emerging topics in uh, biomolecular magnetic resonance, uh, which is organized by Lauren Andreas, Stefan Glöckler, Christian Griesinger, Oscar Millet, Mei Hong, Art Palmer, and myself. So uh, we try to bring to you uh, the best of uh, magnetic resonance in biological systems uh, every week. Um, we're also happy to receive nominations for uh, presenters or topics. And uh, today, uh, as uh, every week, please uh, don't record uh, the lectures because anyway, both speakers from today agreed to record the lecture, uh, which means that they will be made available at the ISRMS YouTube channel, the latest on Monday or so, uh, where you can then constantly uh, look at it. Um, also as a reminder, uh, so uh, because uh, this is a, a webinar Zoom, so uh, don't use the chat uh, function, but uh, do use the Q&A uh, to uh, put your questions uh, either already during the talk uh, or uh, once the talks are finished. So we'll have again, uh, let's say like uh, 10 minutes uh, Q&A sessions after both of the talks uh, where we can try to, or uh, the speakers can try to address uh, your questions. Um, and then uh, after the two talks, uh, the official part will close and uh, you can still hang around. And uh, if you haven't asked any of the questions, we can unmute you and uh, you can speak and uh, place your questions directly yourself. So thank you again. And today the first speaker, we're very happy that Gianluigi Velia agreed to uh, present his uh, exciting work. And uh, so Gianluigi uh, is from Italy, as you might have uh, figured from his name. Uh, so I'm not sure where he was born, but at least he, uh, he studied uh, chemistry at the University of Rome uh, and uh, obtained a Master of Science there. Uh, then he uh, stayed on at the University of Rome uh, and received his PhD in chemistry and uh, both uh, during his master thesis and then continuing with uh, the PhD, he already did NMR studies. Uh, so he really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> I think one can argue. Uh, and then uh, after the PhD, he moved uh, to the US as a visiting scholar at SUNY, uh, so Stony Brook University, and then joined uh, Stan Opella's uh, group as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania uh, for about four years. And after that, actually, he moved to the University of Minnesota, first as an assistant professor, and then sort of uh, rose up the ranks. Uh, and is now a full professor at the University of Minnesota for biochemistry, molecular biology, and biophysics. Thank you very much, Gianluigi, for agreeing to present, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction, and, and um, while I'm trying to share the, the screen, I would like to thank all the organizers for inviting me here and um, give me the chance to, um, to present my my research. Okay. Is the screen okay? Yeah, perfect. All right. So today I'm going to uh, talk about the, the solid state and uh, NMR research that we do in my laboratory. In particular, I would like to um, to introduce this new concept uh, that uh, on you know the definition of a loss tree, like topological loss tree. That was coined coined by my my students at the University of Minnesota, and how you know these uh, small uh, transmembrane proteins regulates large enzymes. CERCA stands for sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. CERCA, CERCA is located in the sarcoendoplasmic reticulum that coats the myofibrils. So these are the myofibrils that shorten and lengthen as your heart beats, particularly now when I'm, you know, a little emotional because I'm presenting this talk. My heartbeat is uh, going faster. Circa basically pumps more calcium within the, uh, within these uh, fibrils and, uh, and uh, generates more contractions. In particular, in my heart right now, uh, because of the coffee that I received, uh, that I had and, uh, and uh, the presentation, is that uh, these proteins are phosphorylated. So they, they actually are in a way activated. And this uh, um, uh, calcium that, uh, you know, uh, enters within these tubules uh, and is uh, shuttled in by this uh, dihydropyridine receptor 
um, stimulates the release of calcium from this ASR, which is the coding of those myofibrils, um, binds the myofilaments, creating these uh, uh, contractions. Then upon ATP hydrolysis gets reuptake in the uh, SR. And this is cyclic uh, calcium transfer is the one that uh, is, uh, occurs on a bit to bit basis in your heart. Um, there are proteins here that regulates the calcium uptake. You know, many drugs have been developed in order to, uh, well, a fair amount of drugs have been developed in terms of uh, regulating heartbeat. However, um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, um, heart dysfunction are caused by, you know, these uh, uh, mutations occurring in these uh, very small uh, membrane proteins. I say uh, protein, uh, proteins instead of protein, because they discover more and more in, uh, in the heart. And you'll see how these uh, proteins that they call regulins. Originally, I studied this uh, small protein phospholumbar, uh, which is the first one to be discovered. But now there are uh, at least uh, six different proteins that regulate these uh, ATPase. Well, if this uh, regulation does not occur, uh, or you know, either by preventing phosphorylation by the CMP-dependent protein kinase, or by you know, uh, misregulation of this protein-protein complex, you know, the heart actually starts compensating for uh, these dysfunctions and enlarges. This cannot occur um, uh, forever. And in fact, many people have a, a early onset uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, which leads to uh, sun, sudden death. Um, the, only, uh, um, the only way to, to prevent this is actually to, to do transplant. But you, you know how difficult it is in this case. So I was talking about regulators and regulants. So these are the regulants that have been recently discovered. This is the work from uh, Olson at uh, UT Southwestern. And, he, and, and so phospholamban and sarcolipin were the original one discovered. Now he discovered um, endoregulin, uh, myoregulin, sarcolamban, which is mostly in the invertebrate. And these are, uh, you know, I think he ran out of names. So this is called another regulin. Um, they discover later, uh, later on an, um, um, another protein, which is called dwarf, we'll see in a minute. Um, all of them regulate the calcium to be within a very tight uh, um, um, uh, physiological window. And you can see how these, you know, the different regulins uh, enhance or, uh, uh, well, decrease the calcium uptake to different extents. Okay, so initially this was a Here's a, even more clear when you look for calcium depends on the calcium uptake, for example, for circa 3A. So these are different isoforms of circas are distributed uh, among different, uh, different tissues. Um, so these are represent in a way physiological breaks to the calcium transfer. Okay, and then they keep the circa within, uh, um, within a function that uh, uh, ensures a phys uh, you know, normal physiological function. However, recently it's been uh, discovered this uh, dwarf, which is a, an activator of circa. So this is important because uh, when uh, you, you, you develop a, a disease, what you want to do, you want to increase the, the heart contractility. The heart usually when, when uh, is under pathological conditions becomes extremely sluggish. What you want to do is you want to activate. And so there's been a, a huge re research in terms of activating, uh, um, um, activating circa. So this could be, this dwarf could be a key in terms of uh, um, uh, developing new maybe gene therapies. One thing that I want to say is uh, um, Roger, Roger Ajar was one of the first one to actually uh, pioneer the, the gene therapy for, for circa. And uh, now Olson is actually uh, just began, it is an article just published on uh, this dwarf gene therapy in the rodents. But, you know, the gene therapy for circa went up to up to humans. But let's go on the structural biology of this, uh, um, of this uh, uh, circa. So this is a, a P-type ATPase, and it means that uh, there's an autophosphorylation uh, um, step within the catalytic cycle. It's a mushroom-shaped structure uh, as an actuator domain, um, a nucleotide binding domain is in green, and there's a phosphorylation or autophosphorylation domain. So this uh, ATP hydrolysis is coupled with the calcium transfer, which occurs in the transmembrane domain. 
So this is a huge distance between the calcium transfer and the um, ATP hydrolysis that occurs right here. All the regulins bind in this cavity between um, 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 the trust membrane four, six, and nine. It's a very greasy uh, cavity, although at the very top in the gesta membrane positions, there are some, some uh, um, um, hydrophobic residues. The work from Nielsen to Yoshima uh, and also to a certain extent Jones has led to, 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 um, to put together um, a puzzle on these, uh, uh, on, on, or uh, if you want, the reaction coordinates of these enzymes. So snapshots around these, uh, these uh, uh, enzymatic cycles. But in the structures now, they, they, uh, I think that they are approximately uh, uh, 50 or, or between 60 and 50 that, that with different, um, under different conditions, uh, different inhibitors and so on. And to be honest with you, you know, it's, you know, it's becoming a little more murky, the fields that we don't know exactly what are the, 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 the steps. But it's a clear that there's a the ATP hydrolysis, uh, uh, so far as a uh, particular because of work from Inesi, there's a couple to these uh, two calcium uh, trans transport per, per ATP, transfer per ATP, and with antiport of, uh, of um, two or three uh, uh, protons. Uh, molecular dynamic simulations by Benoit Roux also helped us to go throughout the whole entire cycle. The problem is that uh, you know all the structures don't get crystallized with uh, with these regulants. There's only two structures by Toyoshima with sarcolipin in only one of the states. Um, yet these regulants bind the the, the ATPase throughout the entire cycle, as is demonstrated by the Thomas work and other and other groups. Um, so that's when uh, solid state and mark comes to the rescue. So these are the membrane proteins. Uh, it's uh, very deleterious to solubilize them in, uh, in detergent because they kill circa. Um, we express the regulins uh, recombinantly, uh, whereas the circa we extract from, uh, from uh, rabbit muscles or pig's uh, heart and, and so on. So the approach that we use is a hybrid approach. We combine oriented solid state and uh, oriented samples, uh, solid state and MR, and magic angle spinning. So you heard a lot about the magic angle spinning and how this is used to obtain very high resolution, um, um, atomic resolution uh, uh, information that looked like almost a solution in MR. You know, I was very amazed by the previous speakers in this, uh, in, in this uh, series. Um, however, these, you know, they don't uh, completely uh, um, uh, offer a view of, a, you know, particular on the, what do we call topology. So the arrangement of a, each single domains with respect to the membrane. Uh, the reason is because uh, magic angle spinning requires the, the spin of the samples and uh, um, in a way obliterates or, or uh, minimize the, the uh, anisotropic interactions. Whereas the oriented solid state and MR recovers this information. But combined the two is extremely powerful. I think many groups across uh, Mei Hong have been using a combination of these uh, Oriented uh, anisotropic and, and, and isotropic uh, uh, restraints in order to do the to do the structure. So what we do is basically we combine the, these two approaches. I won't be too long I, in the magic angle spinning you saw uh, before. Uh, this is a very old slide, and you can see here the four, four kilohertz uh, uh, spinning that removes the anisotropic of the NMR. Uh, um, from the NMR lines and you get very high resolution uh, structures. In contrast, uh, um, um, orient the sample NMR, what it does, you, know, you need to prepare a sample which is a little bit more demanding. Well, quite a, quite a bit more demanding. And uh, you obtain a side resolution due to the fact that the chemical shifts and the dipolar coupling are spread based on the, the, the uh, relative interaction of each single group, in this case NMH, with the, with the magnetic fields, okay? Um, in the past, we had a lot of problems in terms of uh, cooking the sample. You know, uh, we are using now, um, we departed from the, the aligned um, uh, samples with the slide, glass slides, and we're focusing more on bicell preparations. Um, a, a big help was this uh, heat compensated uh, sensitivity enhanced uh, uh, SMP4 uh, experiments. So it's a combination and we, I stole a lot of the ideas from Solution NMR, which is, was my uh, initial uh, passion. 
um, and the steel is. Um, and, uh, you know, we obtain basically, the, we, we, we put in this uh, sensitivity enhancement scheme, uh, increasing the, the, the sensitivity by uh, root, um, uh, square root uh, uh, two. And also this uh, um, 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 heat compensated element that was at first introduced by Rob Bullens and then, um, and, um, and as well as uh, um, uh, Zyderweg. And you know what do we do is that we in using this uh, this approach we actually can push quite a bit in terms of the, the lifetime of the samples, and in fact you know we combine this with a paramagnetic relaxation enhancement, and we were able to actually acquire a three D spectrum in the forty six hours. So these are the, the, the pretty much the, an aligned three uh, um, uh, D uh, spectrum obtained on sarcolipin. I'll go in more detail later on. So by doing this, it's possible to do the classical walk that go from one side to the next side uh, and assign the whole entire backbone of the protein. Um, going to our system, so regulins are thought to oligomerize and form some sort of a channel or storage form. My, my, my group has demonstrated that uh, channels activity is not present in these uh, regulins, but most of them, they actually um, oligomerize prior to deoligomerize and interact with the calcium ATPase. Then phosphorylation of calcium increase basically detaches slightly or rearrange these uh, these uh, um, these regulins and allow the calcium to be tra transported. Um, this is a key problem. So people really have been uh, divided into the community is divided into whether this will be part of a you know of this complex all the time. Or basically detaching from the complex, you know, as a um, as a, a uh, post-translation uh, phenomenon occur. So phospholamban is basically the, this is the structure of phospholamban pentamer monomer, which is the active form that we determined many years ago. Um, so I'll start with phospholamban and I go and attach the other regulins uh, marginally. So. The problem with phospholamban is that when you start the, the, the structure determination, you're going to see that this one is a very tough to understand how you know this would interact with the calcium ATPase. It was only later on that we uh, realized that this uh, amphibody helix actually goes to folding and folding equilibrium. This is look, looks almost like a, um, a typical um, antimicrobial peptides. Um, so. It, you know, by doing the structures, you know, most of our group will actually focus on this T state of, uh, of phosphoron, but, but Baltus actually it was able to, to, um, uh, to see the, the, the presence of a, an unfolded species. So we went uh, more deeply into this and we saw that this equilibrium is actually can be tuned by temperatures, okay? So if you lower the temperature, you populate more the T states. If you increase the temperature, you populate the R states. So our suspicion, we hypothesized that this R state was involved in the regulation. Later on, uh, Martin Gustafsson did uh, um, uh, this analysis of a, a you know, T state equilibrium in the absence and the presence of circa. And we see that uh, you know, the R state is actually, the T state is, gets depleted, but the R state moved to a, what we call a B state. And then with cross polarization, we can see uh, even, even more. And this one is a, you know, throughout the whole entire cytoplasmic domain. Okay, uh, the, the, to be honest with you, in the, the only changes we saw in the transmembrane domain were changes of the metal groups. Okay, because so you know, we see the metal groups at the interface with the calcium ATPase, they change in the chemical shifts, but the rest is pretty much silent. We didn't see huge, uh, huge changes, and neither in the broadening on, nor, in the, in the, nor in the, in the chemical shifts. Was Martin that uh, basically uh, um, engineer um, uh, now is a professor at the University of Copenhagen um, engineer a site in, uh, in the C64 and other other sites to to see whether or not this uh, T state or R state were or in a way bound state were actually responsible for for the forming the complex and by this uh, paramagnetic relaxation was able to actually uh, um, eliminate. Uh, the T state as a as a part of the uh, of, of this uh, um, regular calorie complex. So this cytoplasmic domain, the T states rest and on the on the, on, the, on the surface of the of the of the bilayer, um, whereas the, the 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 R states actually is the one that uh, it follows and binds the the, the calcium ATPase. Um, these are more 
um, you see that the clear paramagnetic uh, quenching of these uh, this, uh, unfolded uh, linear states. Um, however, we didn't have reports, as I said, it is that we extract calcium ATPs from, uh, from uh, pigs or from, uh, from uh, rabbits. And the way to do it is actually to, and to, is to engineer, the way to observe the calcium ATPs changes is to engineer these uh, ethyl groups as, a, as a, a Louis K did with the metal group for, um, uh, for um, solution NMR, we did uh, this ethyl group. So the, the trick is it, that we use basically the C13, C13 to wipe out all the, the lipids and basically observe just the, the, the ethyl groups bound to the calcium ATPs. Now this has a lot of cysteines, but we were able to pretty much label only uh, six of these uh, cysteines uh, um, uniquely because they're the most uh, exposed. With this, we actually were able to actually determine, uh, you know, at least semi-qualitatively uh, distances between these uh, uh, bound state of uh, phospholamban and these, uh, and these uh, um, uh, modified uh, cysteines. And the story was here, we, we stopped here, and I think some of you are, are you know, going to follow my, my research. Now, this was a, the model we proposed, but it was based pretty much on the uh, uh, gymnastic of this cytoplasmic domain, okay? Which, you know, you can push in toward the right using phosphorylation or toward the left in terms of a uh, um, uh, function using the truncation of this, uh, of this uh, uh, cytoplasmic domain. The problem is to understand what is the nature, what, what is the, the, why does it phospholamba inhibit the calcium ATPase? And this, you know, we had to investigate the, the, the trust membrane domain. This was possible to do it only using uh, aligned systems. So um, we aligned the calcium ATPase. You see here the, the typical piece of wheel that you know, Cross, Marassi, and Opella always uh, refer to. Um, in, in order to assign these, uh, these resonances, we use uh, selected labeling, unlabeling, selected unlabeling, uh, 3D experiments that now are possible in, uh, in uh, um, biocells, and also un uh, unrestrained MD simulations to basically model uh, the, and, uh, and look at the chemical shifts and follow the chemical shifts. Um, but, you know, this, uh, the breakthrough was actually to use uh, these uh, three-dimensional uh, experiments that uh, were optimized by uh, Gopinath in, uh, in uh, Tata Gopinath in my group. And this allowed, you know, pretty much the, the spectra to look almost like uh, a solution NMR in terms of uh, uh, walking from one residues to the next. Um, this has also been facilitated by, uh, um, and now a plugin into Sparky that was developed by um, Daniel Weber together with uh, John Mackley and, uh, and Wong Yi Li. Uh, so everybody will have uh, access to these, uh, to, these, uh, to these things now. Um, going back to phospholamber, what we see is that, that uh, we detected now that resolution is higher, and particularly if you go down in the noise, we detect the small peaks. Now we see the small peaks that actually get more populated when you actually phosphorylate the phospholamine. So phospholamine undergoes to uh, order to disorder equilibrium for the cytoplasmic domain and a, a, a topological equilibrium, tilt and rotation, okay, um, of the transmembrane domain. Something that we were not able to see by imaging angle spinning or by order techniques. So the idea is actually to see, is this a equilibrium, the one responsible for regulating the calcium ATPase? And what we did is we, we actually form a complex with the calcium ATPase in these biocells, and we wanted to see if, uh, if the, the biocells were um, aligned. So what we did is, uh, you know, um, uh, Benke in my group uh, synthesized this uh, derivative, and this metal benzene derivative, and cross-linked with the cysteines that we saw before. Now, if we uh, analyze in isotopic bisel, this is, you can see the different peaks uh, uh, corresponds to different sites labeled. But if you see with the, um, with the solid state NMR, the isotropic peak at low temperature become anisotropic only under conditions of alignment. You know, I want to push that, uh, 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 stress that th these alignments that we obtain with these mices are at 25 degrees, which enables basically to maintain the activity of the calcium ATPase. So we know that the calcium ATPase is aligned. We know that phospholamine is aligned. And now, you know, we know by fluorescence that these are interact. 
And we basically can look at the spectra of the free and bound forms as uh, we do with the solution NMR. Uh, interestingly, we see that when it's a bound, uh, particularly the, the, the unlabeled phospholon, but a lot of resonance broaden up. The helical wheel remains because you can see this uh, wheel pattern of these things, but many resonances actually broaden out. And those are the, at the interface between the two, the two proteins, okay? Um, we, we do uh, detect a change in a, in a tail tangle, particularly in, for domain 1B or the phospholon, but it did just a membrane uh, position. Um, the same with the uh, phosphorylation state, although we see the phosphorylation states, all, pretty much all the resonances appear. You know, there's not that much broadening. So the, the, the dynamic uh, of the interactions are completely different between unphosphorylated and phosphorylated. Um, we combine all these things together and uh, together, uh, and uh, um, thanks to uh, Alfonso de Simone and Massimo Sanchez Nandes at the Imperial College of London, we actually uh, now have a, a, a more clear view of this uh, complex. And both the transmembrane domain and the cytoplasmic domain were able to, to model. We did in, include some cross-linking experiments, which we repeated with, the, with our collaborators. The problem is to see, you know, what what, is, what happens with the phosphor uh, in terms of the phosphorylation states. We know that Martin found that this is shift toward the, uh, the bound state. Well, with the phosphorylation state, we see that basically the, the wheel remains almost uh, the same, you know, meaning that the, uh, the transmembrane domains is uh, similar, but some of the uh, the some of the, the the peaks actually shifts, and there's a communication in a way in terms of a, a slightly rotation. And, and a slightly tilt uh, upon phosphorylation. So there's a communication between this side here and actually the transmembrane domain, which is a phosphorylated, and the transmembrane domain of uh, phospholamba. This is more clear when you do the, the modeling. And in fact, we see that, uh, you know, it's almost, uh, so this is phospholamba, and then these are the three uh, transmembrane domains that forms this uh, binding group. Uh, so if you dial in a way phospholamba, if you change basically the rotation or slightly the tilt, you start breaking some of the, the key interactions that gets transmitted to the calcium binding uh, to the calcium binding site. Okay, so this is this is what we call the topological loss. The, tra the, the transmembrane domain does not change the, the helical content, absolutely not. But what it does changes basically the phase in which that they, they um, interact with the several um, with a with a binding group. By doing this, uh, sever, severs so breaks some of the key interactions and allows calcium to be transferred. Um, now we this is an ongoing work. We're trying to uh, reproduce the whole entire cycle, which is very difficult to do by X-ray crystallography because. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to crystallize under conditions in which, you know, there's a calcium bound and calcium free or ATP bound. So uh, although the, the Nissan is doing a fantastic work in terms of, uh, you know, trapping several different centers, uh, uh, several different uh, states, but all the states have not been uh, um, 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 trapped with the, with the phospholamban bound. You can see here how different states, you know, the, the orientation of phospholamban changes throughout the entire cycles. So sarcolipin is pretty much the, the we, are, we use the, the same approach. This is, you know, the, the, the structure of sarcolipin was initiated by Kastub, now is a professor in Hyderabad. And, um, and uh, the, the work was uh, carried out uh, now with, by, by uh, Son Ling Wen. Uh, this is the 3D experiments to, to assign the, the spectrum. We had a lot of work, a lot of help from uh, um, Pedi Asami for cross-linking experiments. We saw that this, as with phospholamban, there's a change in the transmembrane domain that prevents some of the cross-linking. So uh, um, uh, this explains a lot, you know, the, the biological studies that they were not able to explain before. So the, detach the complete detachment of the sarcolipin is not actually observed under our conditions. Um, what we see if we do the spectra free and bound, we see that the, you know, the, the broadening occurs at the, uh, at the interface and some of the, the, the residues also are in the interface with the lipids. It was kind of interesting. However, in the case of sarcolipin, you see no changes, if you see, he is even better, more explained, no changes in the, in the C-terminus uh, or N-terminus that remains anchored to the lipid bilayer. 
the rest of it, the, 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 trust, the rest of the trust member domain changes by a very small angle, two degree angle, if, uh, but of course there's a lot of uh, error associated with it. Um, and um, with, due to the uh, line widths so the, 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 um, uh, and the uncertainty of the fitting. Um, so the, the tilt is uh, small, but there's a, a pronounced rotation of these, uh, of these things as, a, as a, um, a rotation, but more importantly, broadening of the lines when it interacts with the calcium ATPs. So the two proteins interact in a different way with the, uh, with the circa. Um, we also look at dwarf. This is work uh, initiated by Eric and then uh, uh, carried out by uh, Venki. Uh, we did all the assignments. We use it one two D. I'm going to go fast because it, you know, for the sake of time. Um, we assign all the resonances, and we, you know, we determine the tilt. You know, a single a single mutation, as you can see here, changes a, the the angle quite a bit. So if you actually uh, so the dwarf is actually broken right in the middle here. And then if you mut mutated this to alanine, you straighten up the, 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 the helix. Um, these are the spectra with the calcium ATPase free and bound. As you can see, you don't see, any, uh, as in this case, you don't see any broadening. You see mostly chemical shifts occurring, okay? And this brings what, you know, the role of regulants. So what we see, phospholamine, dwarf sarcolipin, these are the, the, the orient spectra free and these are the orient spectra bound. The way of binding, the, the, the binding uh, mode is a completely different in, the, in all the three cases. There's a broadening here, there's a chemical shifts here, some broadening as well, and then an uh, extensive broadening here. So we can see that, it, and these are, you know, slightly different uh, orientation of the trust membrane domain with respect to the lipids. So upon binding circa, we see different, slightly different rotations and tilt angles that differentiate the different regulates. Now the problem is, and that's what you know we still are trying to understand, is this topology bound to the function. Meaning, if you look at phospholamma, sarcolipin, dwarf, and the regulin, and on the regulin, they all change the orientation of the transmembrane domain. So the topology is slightly different. The the the, uh, the the trust management domain are extremely uh, are very uh, are homologous they have a very high identity yet they deliver different type of a uh, different type of function so what we the question that uh, we want to address is uh, how we can actually link this topology the different topology with the functions and that's what I leave to you so. We believe that uh, with phospholamban, we actually found a link between uh, this uh, topological allostery and the regulation of the calcium ATPase. We still um, um, want to uh, investigate the effects of the other regulins and the topology of the other regulins and how they, they regulate, particularly with dwarf, because uh, as I mentioned, is an activator. Um, I would like to stress that uh, you know MAS is doing a fantastic progress, and uh, we're happy that uh, you know this is going faster and faster, particularly for um, so the microcrystalline proteins, but uh, hopefully with uh, membrane proteins as well. Uh, but oriented samples, uh, solid state MR is still quite alive and has a, definitely a role, of particularly in this uh, class of proteins. And in terms of a connecting the topology with function that we need to still work on. Um, with this, I'd like to thank my group, in particular, uh, Daniel Weber, uh, Tata Gopina, Sonin Wang, Venkita Sharawa, uh, Venki, um, Eric, uh, the rest of the current group, these are the Chinese team, and um, a former member, in particular, Martin Gustafsson and Kastub, uh, my funding and the funding from my collaborators, in particular, I would like to mention Alfonso De Simone, um, um, David Thomas, uh, Seth Robia, Alex Zima, and how are you? And you for your invitation and uh, your attention. Thank you, Chen Luigi, for an exciting talk. So uh, just to remind uh, everybody that uh, there's an option to ask questions and please type in your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we already have two questions. Uh, the first one is from uh, Mandar Deshmukh. 
so uh, great talk. Uh, how flexible would be the sidechain ethyl group um, introduced in reductive ethylation and what would be its effect on the accuracy of the distances? I was also wondering, I guess you measured NOEs and so on, so um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. The, the, as, I, as I mentioned, we use a very uh, broad boundaries because the, 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 the problem is that it's not only a, a problem of flexibility, it's a, uh, it's a problem, well, it's a mis mostly a problem of flexibility. When we uh, actually analyze the structure of the bound state, it's a quite dynamic. So the, the boundaries that they, we put is a way is larger than the one that the, um, um, Gerhard Wagner suggested in his uh, original paper on uh, on PREs. So we we just have a you know um, boundary up to ten angstrom you know in terms of a uh, upper upper limit, but we do not um, put any lower limit. Um, but you know, so ten angstrom plus minus I think five angstrom that uh, that we uh, we put. So the the trick is basically to put many probes. One thing that I didn't show is actually we measured uh, um, PRE from the uh, calcium ATPase to phospholamban, but also from phospholamban to the uh, calcium ATPase. Uh, and those ones uh, reduce quite a bit uh, the, um, uh, the spread of the, the conformational uh, ensemble. Um, however, you know, uh, at this point, uh, I have to say that these are very sparse uh, um, um, restraints. And that's why we, with the help of uh, Alfonso de Simone, uh, we actually use a little bit of the force field to drive the, the, the structure. Hopefully I, I answered the question. Thank you. Otherwise, Mandar can ask later again. So Geoffrey Bodenhausen, I would like to know how the oriented samples were prepared on glass plates. I guess you said no, and hydrated or not, or? Oh yeah. So, so originally uh, we use a glass plate and the T2 in that case was extremely uh, uh, short and that we could never uh, um, do, uh, um, we can never do the, um, uh, the you know, 2D or 3D very efficiently. It would take it, for a 2D it would take more than a week. Um, these samples are uh, aligned, but we are preparing with the, with the uh, anisotropic bicells. So it's a Q ratio of approximately four, uh, short lipid, short um, uh, detergent, uh, the HPC, and then a mixture between the MPC and POPC. This allows us to align in the magnetic field at a temperature which is 25 Celsius. Um, it is very important because uh, usually the DHPC, the MPC, align a temperature of 40 degrees. In that case, we, we actually cook the calcium ATPase and we can measure any activity. Under our conditions, the calcium ATPase is fully functional. It can be regulated by phosphorus. Thank you. Uh, Wong He Li uh, would like to know how the assignments are initially obtained. I guess this relates to the PSEMA wheels, but... Yeah, so so the, the the starting point is actually selective uh, labeling, and then you know we we it's very tough because it, you know each single site is not doesn't have a, um, a response. At least you know with this resolution, it's pretty much uh, due to to the alignment. So we can't start from a glycine because we 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 don't have it, uh, um, a clue of what it is. So. We start with a combination of selective labeling, and then we use a three-dimensional uh, spectroscopy to follow, to walk through the residues. Uh, but this is, a, as I said, is a, a combined approach between, you know, uh, isotopic labeling and uh, multidimensional NMR. Okay, thank you. There, there are more questions, uh, but I would like to ask uh, uh, those people who haven't uh, answer, got their questions answered to hang on for the informal session and we would like now to continue to the second speaker. Thank you, John Luigi.